Benvenuti in questa ultima sessione pomeridiana eh, di questo primo giorno intero di Incroci di Civiltà. Abbiamo fatto già un bel giro di mondo eh, partendo dal Giappone questa mattina. E siamo passati per lo Sri Lanka, l'Australia e l'Italia, eh, Israele e un focus sulla razza e una riflessione sulla memoria, la storia e la scrittura eh, nel primo pomeriggio e adesso approdiamo in Kenya. E questo incontro è una cosa a cui noi teniamo sempre in apertura a sottolineare come questi incontri sono possibili, sono possibili per eh, visioni comuni, per progettualità condivisa e quindi non posso che citare il Center for Humanities and Social Change che è eh, neonato a Ca' Foscari e il, il, il nome dice già moltissimo ma ci dirà qualcosa di più dopo il professor Shaul Bassi Waterlines, che è una presenza ormai, una, un paternariato che dura anni, che appunto parla di residenze a Venezia, e naturalmente il Dipartimento di Studi Linguistici e Culturali co, eh, Comparati. Eh, la persona che salirà sul palco tra poco al centro di questa conversazione è davvero un grande della letteratura, è sempre nella, ultimamente è nella lista appunto, di coloro che possono, potrebbero essere dei candidati, candidati al Nobel, quindi noi siamo molto contenti di averlo qui stasera e ti fiamo per lui naturalmente e questo è un incontro che si iscrive all'interno di una serie di iniziative che quest'anno hanno voluto porre l'Africa al centro al fuoco, nel focus del, del pensiero dell'attività dell'Università Ca' Foscari eh, l'Ateneo insieme al Center for the Humanities and Social Change eh, appena citato da Pia ehm, avrà eh, un'attenzione ancora maggiore per l'Africa, eh, saranno aperti due insegnamenti di Amarico e di Swahili eh, per la prima volta qui eh, a Cafoscari e naturalmente eh, di questo poi, da questo poi si geminaranno altri progetti di sviluppo sia per la ricerca che per la didattica in modo tale da portare una corretta e giusta attenzione e conoscenza attualmente nei confronti di questo grande continente. La conversazione di oggi con Gugi Waltiongo, che come diceva Pia è uno dei grandi della letteratura mondiale, è condotta eh, dal professor Shaul Bassi che eh, tra le tante altre cose appunto, è direttore del Center for the Humanities and Social Change eh, a Ca' Foscari e Ijaba Shego che non ha bisogno di presentazioni perché è una fiscionata di incroci di civiltà e di Venezia, è una grande amica, una scrittrice importantissima e sono eh, più che convinto, siamo più che convinti che grazie a loro sarà una conversazione davvero bella e quindi li invito a salire sul palco. Grazie. Tene mono Adoma diaga Namoko Namaguru Notiko Kuruma Asha Hedio Ado Nemakreti and Gare Kanazu Grehenya Shiga Shio the Shia Mure Nishida in a mono Nakruzania Vera Vega No Moko No Moko Namaguru Nishi da in the mono. Toshia or Nagata Shia is here, Mahada. Marogo Masio, Maha and in the mono. 
kimobere kiade kinena kiokora na iru thumwa na nyinyo ya moko ruhe na ikinya marongo macio meonaga mare amuciaro omwe guoko o guoko kwari na ciara ithano na dora ithano ota cia maguru ona mwalero wa ciara ni wa hana ine nyagitungu mweno omwe na nyakanini mweno yogi hideo nyagitungu wa guoko geti detie ni geti de hideo nyagitungu ya guoko geti eti detie ke hana ine na ge akuguru ukuhanereria na ciara ideige moko na maguru ni mate ithanagia ukuga mwire kutwara mugunda dunyo kana ishera riothe kwa batia na koikurukia ile maine kana ko aisia na ko ushururia meteine ona maine marutanagia wera kotidia mwire kolera mai igoro gudabera kana kohora kehidia sheka maod mao na ajira ya gushirira na kuiguithaniria maguru na mokmeta na muihoa ne hoi mire thimo muihoa dai mago ronyeni oiguano amo kana maguru na mokinyo kanirie wa amo ogetoma shiga irege into ne oiru ningiti kana yo ni kuatia moko na mago ohoti wa mugabo kana wakuona kana wakuigua kai kai sio dogata oiru ogesiri oges ogesigria sio ne ate moko na mo na maguru ne mo mastora na gushikira maundu marea sio itagiote kuekira rime Ruki hoyo taro kuma gwe tobo na roki abiria fran o hau kuyudhia na wara e maguru mayali na mokoi ni amakriti ere agihinya ona krobreo shiga ishige ititina na gira deto ikoni mahinya masio riu ikoba mugabo kuma kwe kanwa na ikia kwegana Maguru makoiga ni mo makuga mwire na mo makoma kare makoiga ni mo marutaga wira uri amunene mok moko makegosha ni useke wa mo na ora hiwa ciara cia mo makanyuria utugu na ukuhe wa ciara ici cia maguru magacita wa kuhe kanoru na maguru nema makanyuria ushaka wa asia ra sia mo kama gachita wa sheke mahudu inegene garali na ngushenio igito mawira wa mwire uhwerere kere siega ikihoya otaro rureme rukiuga wega ni ate moko na maguru madhimane hinya rune re sidie rega magitekadia na leo no ni magera ni atia ama makiga maroda ne okuru komwe na wo komwe asha kafai henya age makiga asha kafaba me manie hiyo krogia tumefire iguru woda shedi kanada ma no ise sio de ikrego todo ate ushikidi ati yohodo romero ke ya otaro wektobo na rugi kana reshiria rege 
Osioga, Ego Kanaido Garea Sio, Sikiria, Sikiria, Sigarege, Jata Isidaria. Mokana or Magate Kira Makiro O Muena, Orale Oge Siria, Idoga, Leago da Ridania Jata. Is no, is no get Kaira Kara in Motito, Kuena Roe. Siga Sio de Igrasi Hogete, Muiri to Kaimironio Wati, Rere Moko, Namagro Marangana. Maido, Magasu de Ria Koraya. Nao kuhe. Mato, mai karamategete koi ua kamogabo kao wati ona kai haraya atea. Inni yoro, le keheri ya kemira agedha le kanungira o wati ona 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 ta no na kene maido kana koigua ni mato na ruore meroga ikara ruwe hare ili oka ya kugabu kana kugere ya ruhu ho ruge tabi horo wage chirna uo de motito ine leera ine na maaine na mosia magro mana ikironga na ho nyingi siya siyo ini teta madango kuwere ni ya iroka na dhayo ya rebise ya magagania ya maragi manya mwesio wa desia gedaka gare morodi jogu doiga gamera ngombe na apoko siya hea guhe na adaihu guo via siya medheba siya wa de boko huko na agara guo ingangi dhamaki medheba siya imereti yegi siya gwa ikatigia mereno yegi maaine siya ube siya magoro Mary, Tanya, Gaga, Nanya Rangi, Shoyo Yaga Madagu Neiguru, Niki Naino Gea Kweda Komenya, Nea Mego Sida. Nyoni na Shio no Chibi Chibi Chibi, Ile Honga Ine Siya Mete. Giria na Shio no Koina Itego Tigidiria. Boboe, Menyongoro Etele Maguro, Nea Maguro Magana, Onea Maguro Giri, Siya Kita Kodo Gode. Ve na meteine, she bu no go shema ikuhere iriye haria mwa ga ole no go nangema itiaki da giri ya mwe si ya roga ga na go shuha hoa ngoine jagadi si ya rakana giri na ikahu gura ko uode na ya mete hamwe na mauti ya ikara eki ho kaga mwe na mwe na na reko ina ina kanua. Aki higura mahabura na rebo. Tureko tokenete. Tureko tokenete. Tule mbare ya mbere. Maguro na moko makehetate. Nimegwe tekaniye na ituarea eroleri. Ati ya ogo shido. Dekruta haro. Agome kana ekage wera. Nadia Marakara. Oh. And thank you for who was helping the four legged creature. <laughs> yeah, thank you. For those of you who speak neither Kikuyu nor Italian, we will explain later how to find out the end of the story. So, welcome, Professor Ngugi. It's a real honor and a pleasure to have you here. As uh, we heard before, this session is sponsored by the Center for the Humanities and Social Change, and you epitomize the role of the humanities to enable social change. Gugi Wationgo is a literary giant. He has reinvented himself as a writer several times over the years. In the 1960s, he wrote uh, the first groundbreaking East African novels in English. In the 1970s, he decided to turn to his native Kikuyu 
and used drama to engage the masses and novels to expose the political corruption of the post-colonial state. He paid with imprisonment and exile. In the 1980s, he wrote, among other things, the enormously influential book, Decolonizing the Mind, showing how colonization was a psychological and linguistic process even after the end of political colonization. In the 1990s, he continued to produce novels and made uh, substantial contributions to post-colonial theory. And in the new millennium, has published three volumes of memoirs, which are a wonderfully rich tapestry, not only of an individual life, but also of a nation in the making and of the power of education and literature. And I'm glad to uh, emphasize that uh, most of Professor Ngugi's books have been translated into Italian and that the memoirs will be published, the new uh, volumes will be published later this year and uh, at the uh, beginning of um, 2019. It's a great pleasure to share the stage also with friend and colleague Ijaba Shego, who has uh, today has had a lot of heavy duty. She's been on stage several times, so we thank her for her staying power. And uh, um, who's a fellow of the Center for the Humanities and Social Change, is associated with the Archivio Scrittutrici Migranti, the Archive for Women uh, Migrant Writers. And I would like her to start the conversation with the first question for Thank you. How are you an accent? Add bon for Sanahai, Mante in a Kulad Lo Ustad in Google at Yongo. I use my native language, one of my native language, Somali language, to say that I'm so happy to be here with you today. It's a big honor. It's the second time that we met you on the stage because the first time was in Mantova in 2012 for the Festival of Literature in that city and I remember your powerful speech and I want to thank you to say thank you to Professor Bassi because of uh, presentation and in Venice of course and I want I want to and I try to, in this conversation, to add my voice, voice of Afro-Italian, uh, Italian, Somalian, Afro-European writer that live always in between, between Europe and Somalia. Uh, I've read several times in a different moment of my life your powerful essays, novels, and your memoir. I love them so much. And my first question is about your memoir. He was born in 1938 in Kamiritu, a village in the north of Nairobi, one of 28 children of a father with four wives. The women of your family, in general the women in Africa, carry the society upon their shoulders, but the society in Africa, and not only in Africa, in Italy for example, is so misogynist. There is in the world, this is my opinion, a war against women, but not in your memoir, Dreams in the Time of War. The women were so important in your childhood. For example, your mother pushed you at school and your relationship with her are so special. And Wangari, I love so much Wangari, one of the wives of your father gave to you a gift of storytelling. You love and respect women a lot in your memoir and of course in your life. For that reason, I want to ask you about your relationship with the women of your life above all family. And what do you think about the role of African women in the society now? Yeah, well, it, um, it, it's true. I come from a, a big family. Yeah. The way I put it is that I had four, I was very lucky, I had four mothers and one father. So the, there was a senior mother, uh, then the one who followed her. My mother was the third mother, and after her, there was a fourth mother, you know. But they really were all our mothers, anyway. So uh, my father was really a distant figure in our lives, you know. He was there, the patriarch, so to speak. But real life for us, you know, uh, 
revolved around the women, particularly or rather our mothers, you know, particularly the storytelling sessions in the evening. It was very, very important to me, actually. I still visualize the sitting around the fireside and and now that I have learned about the role of, of light huh, in defining the human figure, uh, what I still remember is the, because we didn't have electricity, it's just fire, wood fire, and so the flames would move. So in a, in a sense, the faces of the people present always changed because the flames were changing all the time. And uh, so, that, you know, uh, so I remember all that, it's very, very important, you know. Uh, of course, historically, uh, and in Kenya in particular, women have really played um, a very important role, particularly in the struggle against the British colonialism, because women, when the men were detained in prison, women kept the homes doing everything, but, but in prison, women were also there. In the mountains, women were also there fighting. Uh, so really, women were everywhere, literally. You know, uh, so there's no aspect of our lives in Kenya which is not impacted by uh, women. And I suspect it's the same thing in Africa as a whole. But when the story is told of our struggles and so on, you know, uh, the woman is often portrayed as playing a kind of passive role, uh, helping men to make history kind of thing. I think it's a general thing, you know. Uh, yeah, but they, they made history, you know, they were makers of history as well. Uh, of course, I remember my mother in particular because she um, she's the one who dreamt of my education. In other words, education for me really was, I think, more her dream before it became mine, right? Uh, so she's actually the one who asked me do I want to go to school, right? I've been thinking about it as a, as, a, as a remote possibility, not as a real something that can happen, but she's the one who articulated uh, what I was feeling and so on. So I've always been very grateful to her. Now, the thing about my mother is she could not read or write. Yeah. But she supervised my homework. <laughs> oh yes, she did. <laughs> and the way she, most of you, those of you have read my memoir, uh, you know, Dreams in a Time of War, will know about the story of my mother and how whenever I came home, because she could not read or write, so the only way she could know how I was doing was literally by asking questions. But not interrogation. She had a way of asking in such a way that the story just comes out, you know, by where she asked it here and there, you know. And what I remember once is telling her I had got something like a hundred percent, and she asking me, "Is that the best you could have done?" Right? And that's that notion of the best that one could do, because I realized she was more interested in the effort that one had put into the work. It seems it's what she really wanted, but she put it always in terms of the best, you know. So the notion of the, or the best was somehow ingrained in me long before I actually went to school, or rather before I graduated from primary school, because she kept on insisting on this best. I become, say, number one. Is that the best? <laughs> right? 
I go to the best high school. I mean, the best by the best. I mean, it was the most prominent for African kids. It was so difficult to get to that particular school, Alliance High School. And she just, all she wanted to know, because she did not know much about the school, whether, whether that was the best. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say yes. And that whole notion of the best really came from her. And the notion of education came from her. It was her dream before it became mine. But it's true. In a way, my mother symbolizes you know, uh, most of the women in Kenya, probably in Africa. As so a whole. Because we shared the same experience, my mom, to don't read, don't write. So I know, I know the situation, but she pushed me at school. She pushed me to write. Uh, to, to do books, so I know very well your experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, yeah, but the problem, as we are saying, otherwise, is that the, in the actual, it does not always emerge in the actual telling of the history and so on. Uh, yeah, in the case of Kenya, we have generals fighting, women generals, we are fighting against the British where their units, which they led, you know, uh, but you don't really hear very much about them, you know. Uh, although the situation is now changing, with more women not only educated, but writing, telling their own story, this perspective is changing. You can actually see it in my own family. Uh, oh, my family, not my father's, my, my family now. I have, what, how many children do I have? Ah, nine only. <laughs> yeah, and five of them are writers. You know, five, no, four, I think five of them are published novelists and, you know, yeah. And one of them is the girl, because they have only, only three girls, the others are boys. And I noted, although they, they went through similar experiences, like Mukoma Wangoge and Wajiko, Wajiko is a girl, they went through similar experiences because they, had, like they, were, they differ by one year. So they were sibling, had this sibling rivalry, you know, and, uh, and she always said whatever Mukoma, her older brother, by one year could do, she could do. She didn't like the idea that Mukoma was being favored for this, and she would sort of, you know, uh, Mokoma puts on trousers, she demands to have trousers as well, you know, or whatever. Mokoma goes to places where there's are in cattle, she insists on being there, you know. Uh, so, um, so I noted, when it came to their novels, Wajiko wrote a novel called um, The Fall of Saints, and Mokoma wrote Nairobi Heat, uh, and, and the others, uh, boys, you know, uh, have different novels and so on. But you can see the emphasis. It's very interesting. Naturally, although they have gone through the same experience, Wanjiko is a girl, women clearly dominate the narrative, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, with the boys, even when they give credence to women and so on, but you can see very clearly the perspective is that of a man in society, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm very glad to say that now with the rise of women writers in Africa, really, it's making, you know, the story of Africa will be a bit more balanced, yeah, right, yeah. Talking about the best, I'm happy, and I hope the rest of the audience will not be bothered by that, happy that we have a lot of our students here, and uh, I want to say hello to the students. And they have been reading uh, The House of the Interpreter. Uh, and the reason for that is that this has not been translated into Italian yet, because I want to make sure that they would not use the Italian translation. Uh, but I want to, to say and to suggest to uh, the rest of the audience that Dreams in a Time of War is a wonderful way to start reading about the life of Gugi and what it meant to be born in a colony what it meant to be involved in an anti-colonial struggle and also what it meant to engage in education. So I would like to ask you, 
what is it like to write about yourself, about your childhood, about delving into the past, reaching back to events that took place many decades ago? Uh, can you say something about the process of writing about your life? Yeah, first of all, let me say that the, the idea of writing was again not, well, writing my memoirs was not mine. For many years I tried to write about myself and I just could not. And I knew the reason why. Because all novelists, well, let me not say all, but most novelists, or most writers really draw uh, from themselves. You know, you know the, 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 it's as if they are writing about themselves in some ways even though they are writing about other characters and so on, because the emotion they find in their novel is probably it's, they are drawing from inside themselves, so to speak, you know. So I always felt as if I had written about myself in my first four novels, The River Between, uh, Weep, I swear, Weep, Weep Not Child, and uh, even A Grain of Wheat, because I was drawing from the both personal and the collective experience of the people. So I always felt a little bit, uh, what more can I say about myself? And then I think my wife, <coughs> Jerry Wago, who I give a lot of credit for this, she, she looked at me one day, we're in California, and, and she said, you know, don't think you are getting younger. <laughs> I think she was trying to avoid the word old. You are old. But she said, you're not getting younger, you know that. You know, and um, soon you're going to have grandchildren. Eh? And, uh, you know, you'll not always be there to tell them stories of the past and long ago, you know. So she's really the one who pushed me a little bit to write my memoir. Uh, the first one, Dreams in a Time of War. And uh, when I started, I realized so many things were coming to the fore, you know, that I had not really thought about. I'd written about them here and there, really. Like, if you read uh, my first novel, Weep, oh, to be published, Weep Not Child, it draws a lot from that collective experience. Um, uh, but I found it fascinating writing my memoir, right? And I found two things which became very important in all my memoirs. Um, I have a theory which has evolved over time. I don't, I don't know whether it's a theory, but anyway, it's a theory anyway. <laughs> it's called global lectics, like global lectics, yeah? And it's, it arises also from my other, one of my other books, which I call Moving in the Center, where I say, in opposition to Europe being at the center, I say, no, no, any place in the world is really can be the center of the world, you know. Wherever we are, you know, Venice or Limuru or, you know, Somalia or a town somewhere, even our own bodies can be centers of the world, you know. Uh, uh, and I realize, for example, if I might say so, if I might say so, so if you look at, just look at yourself, please, if you don't mind, you know, look at the clothes you are wearing, eh? right? So you will start writing about you or about yourself, you worry about the clothes you are wearing, then we have to think, where do they come from? Where were they made, <laughs> right? right? The cloth that made them, right? And maybe China or Nairobi, huh? right? Who made them, <laughs> right, you know? Uh, where, how do they, you know? In other words, what has impacted me, you? Huh? You find so many streams from all over the world, you know, uh, impacting your own, 
who you are, who I am at any one moment. So I came to the conclusion gradually that we actually literally carry the world on our shoulders, so to speak. We are Hercules, huh? <laughs> right? Is it Hercules who carried Atlas? Oh, we are Atlas, actually, come to think of it. Yeah? Each one of us, Atlas, we carry the world. So that sense of carrying the world you know, on our bodies is really what drives my memoirs. You know, uh, um, for instance, I was born in 1938. Colonial Kenya, meaning Kenya was a settler colony, colony by the British, right? So that's already one story. <laughs> that growing up, I'm seeing plantations owned by white people and African people working, including myself. I started working as a nine-year-old, right? You know, picking tea leaves and so on. You know, uh, that's one reality. But I was born in 1938. What is 1938? The eve of the Second World War. Huh? So when I was growing up uh, around Limuru, as a child coming to consciousness, who was around me, you know, uh, Italian prisoners of war, right? So that's how I learned words like ciao, you know, buona sera, but <laughs> I said buona sera because it's all very my sister, who is called Sarah. So, so we always thought we were talking about her. <laughs> Buena Sarah. <laughs> Buena Giono, you know, ciao. I mean, you know, so if I write about that period, then I had to write about Italian prisoners of war. Then I had to write, think about Italy. Then, I, you know, there are so many things. Of course, I have to be selective, but you can see many things impacting our own lives. Another thing which I talk about in the memoir. I remember a song. It's a dance we used as kids, you know, you know, sort of. Uh, very, very. The rhythm was so good, you know. But I didn't pay very much attention to the words. But it was like this: the soloist. Is that was a call and response. The soloist would say something, something. But the chorus will always Giuma coming from Japan. Giovanni, we call it Giovanni, which sounds like a name. No, Korekia uh, Bobomu. Bobomu. Right. So the soul is saying, the chorus was always blah, 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 you sing, and then you, you, the chorus is, as I came from uh, Giovanni. To drop bombs, right? But bomb, bomb then they sound like a bomb. It sounds like something nice. Bomb, bomb, huh? bomb, bomb because of the rhythm. Bomb, bomb. Giovanni didn't sound like a country. It just uh, something. So it's only later when I'm writing this memoir that oh, I said, of course, we're singing and dancing about the um, Hiroshima. Yeah, and you were in a rural village somewhere, right? But we're seeing about that. I don't think if you ask any of the kids, they are said we're talking about a real bomb somewhere in Japan or something. But we were seeing about that, you know. So even writing that memoir, I found myself in conversation, literally, uh, with the world. You know? I did globalistic connection, you know. And the same thing is more or less true of my other memoirs, you know, uh, in the House of the Interpreter and um, and the, the, the third one, uh, Birth of a Dreamweaver, yeah. This is the right moment to remind you that we'll have further opportunity to meet uh, Gugi Wationgo next week, and if I can ask to have the Water Lines uh, slide. Um, water Lines is a program, a joint program of uh, the Cafosca International College of Fondazione Venezia and San Servolo Servizi Metropolitani uh, that brings uh, writers to be in residence in Venice for 
few weeks and to engage with our students and also with local artists. So there will be a special session on uh, memory and, 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 and narration, memory self and narration next Friday. And students, some of the students of the college, some of other students will be interviewing Professor Ngugi on 11th on the island of San Servolo. So you are all very welcome. Uh, technically, your first memoir was actually the memoir about your detention because you and your family fought against the British, but you went to jail after Kenya became independent. Yesterday, we heard Ian McEwan uh, talking about life in prison and being told that in prison uh, every day is like any other. And I think Ijaba has a, a question on, on, on your experience in prison. I resume your experience in prison because um, when you went in the committee maximum security prison for the writing um, of your play, Angahika and then Denda, uh, sorry for pronunciation, I will marry when I want. And in prison, you wrote the novel uh, Devil on the Cross on the toilet paper. What does the act of writing mean to you personally in that moment in jail? And what does this act mean now in a different age? Oh, yeah, first of all, oh yes. Yeah, last night, actually. We looked at each other last night uh, when, uh, that, you know, by the way, I don't want, most of you had a talk last night, a fantastic conversation, you know, last night. It was so engrossing, uh, or I was engrossed in the entire conversation. Uh, and but I was so engrossed until uh, Ian said something about, about uh, he has been told that those who are in prison time passes something quickly or something because things are the same and I said I, I, <laughs> I automatically shook my head oh no <laughs> because what I remember in one one why one year in uh, Maxwell Security Prison, that was 1977, his time was so uh, slow, right, for me. Uh, no, it was really very slow. And the f doing the same thing over and over again, you know, you do the same things. Uh, ours was political detention, not convicted, as it was. So it was like real punishment, because you don't know whether it might be released tomorrow or one year, ten years. Among the pe people I found in political detention was one who had been there for ten years. <laughs> so. Measuring my stay with him or against his time in prison, I was thinking, oh my God, I'll be here for <laughs> at least 10 years. What do I do with those 10 years? You know, uh, uh, So it's, it's really life moves very slowly. But of course, when you come out, there's a difference. Things are so, even one year might look as if it's one day because really what you did there was more as a repetition of the same thing over and over again so on looking back you might say ah time looked as if uh, went very quickly but in reality it's a very laborious you know um, sameness and so on and for me writing that novel in prison <sighs> was a very important break it had helped me really manage time Right, because it was always my novel to go back to, uh, and to stolen, whatever, like stolen kisses, I suppose, or something like that. Sweet, very nice, you know, because you are breaking. It's part of resistance. You are doing. Okay, let me explain here. I was put in a maximum security prison in Kenya in 19. 77. But I was not actually the first writer in Kenya to be put in prison. The British had put very many poets of the people in prison. You know. But, and also in post colonial Kenya, that is, we got our independence in 1963. Uh, 
So, I, even then, I was not the first writer in the post independent era to be put in prison. Guess who was the first, as far as I know, and he's here among us. Uh, where is he? Abdulatif Abdallah. Ah, he's there. <laughs> Abdulatif Abdallah he's, tomorrow morning he's hiding there. Yeah. Come on, Andrew, please stand so I can see you. He's very important, you know, a Kenyan East African life, uh, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because in so many ways, he's the one who taught us how to cope with prison. Because when he was in prison, at the same prison as I went to, he came out with uh, poems which have become classics. Uh, Saudi Athiki, which he wrote in prison. And when I was in Kamete, the block where he was, was next to ours. So we used to point at this where, <laughs> where he wrote Saudi Athiki. Uh, so he was very important also in my own life in terms of just many things, but really in terms of how to cope, how does a writer cope with prison, you know, experience, yeah. Yeah, so let me just put it this way. I was put in prison because of writing a play in a Koyo language to be performed by Camaredo. You are talking about Camaredo, yeah. And in prison, I was thinking, why? I've read so many novels which were critical of the post-colonial scene a grain of wheat, for reasons, or for that matter, petals of blood. But nothing happened to me. Now, I write a play in a koyo, performed by, literally, by working people in the village, you know, plantation workers, you know, landless, I mean, sort of, you know, we are doing it together. It was wonderful. And I thought I was doing a very good job, you know, sort of, you know, work. A professor for the University of Nairobi, taking his time from Nairobi, to go to the village and work with the uh, ordinary men, women of the village. You know, so I was thinking I'm doing a good, I'll get a, I'll get a government medal at the end of this. But actually, instead, I, I was put in a maximum security prison. Now, that became very, very important for me for two reasons. One, I really started thinking about the language question, basically. That's really my thinking on the language question started at Kamete Maximum Prison. I mean, think about seriously and desiring if I move to do something about it. Before then, I had thought about the language question, but I was thinking, ah, something is, can wait, you know, ah, yes, I can do this, you know. But now it became very urgent for me, and the only way, ah, okay. So it was in prison that I decided to part ways with English language, uh, at, at least for my novels, poetry, and drama. I said, I'm in prison because of writing Inigi Koyo, my mother tongue. So now I'm going to write in the very language which was the basis of my incarceration. Right? And when I look at it, I say, wait a minute. I mean, I could see Kenyatta and the others, they have, when the president moving around, he's guarded all the time. Huh? Wait a minute. Me, I'm guarded also all the time. <laughs> right? I get free food, uh, free bed, <laughs> free everything. And I'm guarded 24 hours a day, even when sleeping. There is a guard at the door, huh? right? So um, I said I must write in a language which was the basis of my incarceration, okay? Because that way, it was a kind of resistance, and for me, resistance to be able, I don't know who was talking about no yesterday, as a very nice word, and I was nodding my head, say yes, the word no. Uh, to injustice or to other things, very, very important, at least for me, uh, very important. And that, that no was very important to me uh, in 
make me survive that one year without books, without paper, literally, and so on. And writing the novel on toilet paper, the only paper available to me became an act of defiance, of resistance, but also enjoyable. Because in the world of the novels and so on, you can, you know, uh, you have so many characters and so on. So you are, as you have a conversation with characters and situations and so on, you know. So that's how I came to write the, uh, it was an act of survival, really. An act of resistance and also survival, okay. And the, other, the novel is called Wrestling, no. They were on the cross, they were on the cross. And I wrote a memoir about that experience in prison called Detained, a writer's prison diary. But I have reissued the memoir, a bit edited, uh, to remove some of the dated historical documents which I had put in the first one, and left only the narrative of my writing that novel in prison, okay? So the title of the new memoir, really edit, developed for the earlier one, is now called Wrestling with the Devil. And actually after here, I'll be going on a book tour, uh, reading from the memoir, Wrestling with the Devil. But the Wrestling with the Devil, of the Devil, on the cross, uh, right. Well, that uh, epoch-making decision to abandon English and start writing Kikuyu is also um, at the basis of the short story that we, we, we heard earlier. So can you say something more about this story and the project about which that story is part? Yeah, as I said, two things came out of prison. One, of course, my writing that novel in Iko was very important. Psychologically, it was so, so important for me. Because uh, I don't think, on looking back, whether I would ever have written in Iko if I had not been put in prison. And I'm not saying that anybody should be put in prison. You know, try it. Please, don't go to prison. If you can help it, okay? <laughs> right. But for me, it was, it helped me Cross the boundary which colonial psychology had prevented me from, you know, uh, crossing. And I was able to do it. I was very, very proud of that. But as I said, also in prison, I started thinking about the language issue and the colonial situation. So when in 1984, I was invited by uh, Auckland University by actually your friend, <laughs> Michael Neal who wrote to me last night to say hi again, as in the, yeah, uh, to give a series of lectures on the politics of language in African literature. All the notes that I had not made in prison about the language issue came to the fore. And this is what became the book, Decolonizing the Mind, which is probably one of my most popular books. Uh, although I was in India recently, and everywhere I went, everybody was, the only book they knew about me was Decolonize the Mind. And as a novelist, I would say, why can't, it, can't they also mention one of my novels? Huh? Because they all, the book they were mentioning all the time was Decolonizing you know, the Mind. So that's why I came to think about the language thing. Now it's become a big debate in Africa. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh. Italian translation. Okay. Uh, yeah, Decolonize. Yeah, I can't say it in Italian. But anyway, uh, let me tell you about the genesis of the story of the upright revolution. Uh, its genesis was actually an argument I had with my daughter, Mwambi, uh, about, she's into, into in philosophy, and I was the one that we were discussing, the question of one, you know, I don't know, she had this about one. She had read some Greek philosophers. I don't know who, you know. So it's arguing about one and, you know, one being a, 
and so many things about one and then uh, I had to write a story for her because in our family as a continuation of the other tradition I grew up with uh, instead of giving gifts I started to encourage people giving non-material gifts like when I, you write to me why can't tell me a story write me a poem Give me something, not something into which you have put some effort into it. Okay? Uh, so, the children turned tables around. When they were bothered, they said, Okay, write me a story tomorrow huh? <laughs> for my birthday. Okay? So, I started writing stories for them for birthdays and Christmas. And this one I wrote for Mombi for her Christmas. As a Christmas gift, and I kept it in my shelves, you know, until a group of young people in Kenya, or based in Kenya, they call themselves Jalanda Pan Africa Collective. They came up with this journal called Jalada, and they want to bring out a translation issue in which African languages talked to each other, right? So they turned to me through my son, Mukoma, who is a professor of English at Cornell University, the author of Nairobi Heat Years. And they said, why can't you please ask your father <laughs> to give us a story, originally a Koyo language, so that we can launch this campaign. Now, I didn't have a story. I mean, I was very happy, but you know how it is. You cannot create to order. You know, so write me a story and you just do it. But anyway, then I remember the story that I had written for Mombi. So I gave it to them. This was, I think, November 9, 20, 2015, I think, or November. By March, they had, had translated into uh, about 30 African, Af 30 languages including most of them are African languages. And up to now, as we are talking, it has been translated into seven, I think 78, isn't it? more than 70 languages in the world, including Italian. But once again, most of them are African. But they are also Asian languages, Middle Eastern, and recently, it was translated into one of native American languages, uh, not Spanish, but one of the, there are very many languages in Mexico and so on. Uh, the New York subway library system have adopted it for some of their Wi-Fi. I don't know what, how it works and so on. Yeah, so the story has really taken a life of its own, uh, literally, yeah, and um, so that's how it came to be, right? <clears throat> I don't know if you had the time to write it down, but if you go to the website jaladaafrica.org, J-A-L-A-D-A, that's where you can find most of the translations yeah, yeah. in multiple languages, <clears throat> an amazing, an amazing, amazing yeah. website. Or, or simply Google the upright revolution, yes. it might take you to Jalada. Jalada is J A L A D A. The Jalada. The story is the upright revolution. And it's actually fascinating to go to their website <coughs> and see these 70 languages or so, you know, some of them with different scripts, and they are all together there more. As you can literally. Even visually, aesthetically, just moving from one to the other is very fascinating to see languages in some kind of uh, proximity to each other because the new technologies allow us to do that, you know. Uh, but also the different characters they have as different scripts as well. Yeah. It's, it's funny if I may interject that today I was trying to print out the original Kikuyu and the first message I got from the printer say, 
printer doesn't recognize the characters, and so I had to try again because they, of the accents of, of the of the Kikuyu. Yeah. By the way, uh, we are very proud at Kafoskari to uh, be able to offer uh, as many as 40 languages to our students. Uh, most of them that uh, express several cultures and as was reminded earlier we are adding in a very important symbolic gesture Swahili and Amharic in, in the fold in, in our um, attempt to enrich the African presence at, at Kafoskari. Uh, we are still I think trapped in this um, mentality of monolingualism. Uh, Italian, you know, Italy has been a multilingual uh, a nation that in a way has disavowed a lot of the other languages so it's very important that we recognize that it's healthy to be to have a lot of languages and yeah. uh, and, and I think that and, ve and very unhealthy to have only one I think very unhealthy to have only one no, very another. unhealthy oh okay unhealthy unhealthy, unhealthy. <coughs> yes, yeah of let, me, let me give them this statement actually it's very important I always say wherever I go because I think it's well I say monolingualism is a carbon monoxide of cultures. <laughs> Multilingualism is the oxygen of cultures. You know? So I hope people will... <laughs> I hope you will choose oxygen rather than carbon monoxide. You know? Uh, which is also gives me the perfect cue to say that there are some people here who are trying to help those of us who are not necessarily uh, uh, multilingual in, in the appropriate one. So I want to thank the wonderful professionals who are providing the simultaneous translation here, Emanuela Cotronei and, and Paolo Maria Noseda, who I am asking to translate everything I'm saying now. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Part of what it says just is <coughs> one. Uh, among writers, the people have come to, re to really respect are translators. You know, uh, even like last night when you that wonderful conversation, they, you know the, how the translator was talking. You know, it's she and the author. See, they were kind of into each other, and uh, translation. <coughs> I. <coughs> In this multilingualism <coughs> I talk about, translation then becomes very, very, very important. So I think of translation, another saying which I developed as a way of uh, yeah, translation is the language of languages, or a translation is a common language of languages, you know, is a language which all languages speak, right? Yeah, and I really have to come to value translators and interpreters. I put them very, very highly for their enabling this conversation among languages here. Yeah. No, just I want to, to say one word about languages because it's your, your project, Jalada, is really important because we need biodiversity of languages above all in Africa because yeah, I'm Italian, I'm Somali, and in Somali, in that moment, we have a big problem. War, of course, terrorism, but one of the problems is language, is our language. I calculate that in 30 years, we lost our language. Uh, because in young people, above all, politicians use more other languages, English, Arabic, uh, Turkish, and in, in a way, I think that we, colonialism is never end above all in that sector of language. And I want to ask you, um, okay, this project is okay, but in Somalia or in countries like Somalia, um, how can we do to preserve our biodiversity? Because it's not easy at all. For example, I think a lot, I'm an Italian writer. In, and I have no the knowledge of language that my mother had, for example. Um, I write in Italian, I know Somali, I speak Somali, but it's impossible to me to preserve the 
old poems. And it's difficult to people there in, in a situation of war to do this. And I want to only an advice to you for, for Somali people and, and the other people like us live this terrible situation because if you lost your language, you lost your culture, you lost your memories. And when I speak with the refugees, for example, they forgot all about Somalia in the, pa in the past. And our peace is so fragile in that moment. So, and you know better than me than Kenya in that moment built a big wall uh, between Somalia and Kenya. This is um, it's quite difficult because I read in your essay that you say that we are um, a big one country in Horn of Africa, we are all the same. So why is it so difficult to create something in common and to preserve language and to preserve culture in that place in the world? Yeah. I think two things. <clears throat> one, we cannot, uh, we can overemphasize the importance or the negative impact of colonialism on so many societies, and it has to do with the psyche, with the mind. It's not well. I know there's economics and there's also politics and so on, but really, it's the mental universe. That's why I call my book "Decolonizing the Mind," uh, because it's so strong, it's so inbuilt. It's <coughs> you know, <coughs> in a way. <coughs> colonialism. <laughs> when I, whenever I'm about to attack it, I get that cough. <laughs> yeah. One of the problems we really have all over the world, not just those who are colonial, past for, is the whole conception of relation between languages and cultures in terms of hierarchy. You know, the whole notion that my language is not enough that I like my language and my culture, in, it must be better. <laughs> it must be better than your culture, you know, in, in my estimation. That's the idea that there are cultures which are inherently, some languages which are inherently more of languages than other languages, you know. That there are some cultures which are inherently more of cultures than other cultures, you know. That's whole, what I call linguistic feudalism, <laughs> you know, governs uh, a lot of the relations between, you know, uh, uh, languages, right? Uh, and in Africa, we have tended to, oh no, actually, literally all over the world. Let me give you an example of, <clears throat> of Spanish, for instance. Yeah? Spanish, it, within Spain, it marginalizes non-Spanish languages, more or less. I know this because I was there recently, and I know Catalonia, they are sort of up. <laughs> you know? But in the, new, uh, in the, in the, in the Americas, Spanish marginalizes uh, Native American languages that were there, you know, they are marginalized, you know, by Spanish. Spanish, Spanish is a language of power. Mm -hmm. But guess what? In America, United States, Spanish is marginalized, <laughs> right? Like, you know, so, it's, so languages are not inherently more of language than any other language, you know. When you talk about this hierarchy, we're talking about hierarchy of an equal power relationship. It has nothing whatsoever to do with languages. You know, languages naturally feed into each other. They can, words can travel from one language to another and so on. You know, uh, hierarchy is a reflection of how we have come to organize our societies. Uh, Remember, hierarchy is not enough that I am healthy. It's more important that I'm healthy and one, the other people cannot be not healthy. 
it's not enough that I'm a billionaire. There must be a billion poor, right? <laughs> you know, it's not enough that I live in a palace. There must be people living in prisons, right? That notion that in order to be, others must cease to be, is so ingrained in how we think about society and so on. And, you know, of course, was in a colonial, you know, system, you know, uh, the whole idea that European languages are inherently more of languages than those of the colonized. But it's not, it's not just a case of African languages and European languages, you know. Um, Ireland, you know, I like quoting Ireland because I find it very fascinating. Um, it leads to English language, right? You know, Ireland is European country. Uh, uh, by, oh my God. But when the English has settling in, and I don't, I don't give a history version, but when the English has set, settlement, settling in Ireland and so on, uh, initially, when the English settlers went to Ireland, because the Irish was more vibrant, naturally, they were drawn to the more vibrant language. And then London started saying, oh, this is very bad. You know, it's not, it's the conqueror who makes the conquered learn their language, not the other way around, you know. Uh, so you can see as early as, I don't know, 20, I don't know, 13, 16, 66 or something, I don't know how they did. There's, for instance, the Edict of Kilkenny, you know, in which actually there are laws saying if, uh, People speak, it's very English settler, they speak Irish with the vicinity of the English settlement, they might even lose their land or be punished and so on, you know. Huh? You know. But even those laws were not enough. By 1595, uh, Spencer had to write a book called A View of Ireland at the Present Time. And this is a conversation between an, a visiting English lord visiting Spencer, uh, visiting a new settler in a place called Munster in Ireland. And what are they arguing about? How to tame the Irish. We're talking about 1595. How to tame the Irish. And what do they come up with? Names. They say, you can get rid of their marks and their O's and so on, and then they'll forget who they are, right? The other was language. English. So these things were, they are, they are, if you read Spencer's book, A View of Ireland at the present time, all these things are there. Let me give you another example. Japan colonized Korea between, say, 1910, I think, 1945. What did they do? They imposed Japanese on the Koreans, you know, and Japanese names. So it's all over the world. It's done to Native American. Uh, languages all over, right? The same pattern. You know. So, what all this comes to be is that the, 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 in post colonial societies, we sometimes can normalize the abnormalities of the colonial system. And we can sometimes act as if that abnormality actually is the norm. It's how you do things, you know. So the government, our governments, have to change policy. You know, you know, we, you and I can do something about it, but the government have to change policy towards African languages. You know, remember I was put in prison by an African government. Yeah, in fact, a speaking president is the one who put me in prison for writing a coil, so, so, right? So a lot of publishers had to change. We carry this mountain here, I don't know how to call it, psychological mountain here. And when I, if I get my book in a coil, my publisher will take uh, ages for it to come out. But translation to English to come out within a year or, you know, you, you know Sometimes I take them to a, I take a book to them, and they say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." But when will the English translation come out? Huh? Right. 
In other words, we had a lot to do, a lot of work, a lot of challenges, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can I play the devil's advocate here for a second? Yeah. Um, I spent time in Kenya and I talked to a lot of you, of your younger colleagues uh, and most of them have, of course, you know, they worship your work, you're so important for them. But those who were born after 1963, mm -hmm. after independence, mm -hmm. for many of them, English was a presence in their, especially middle class family from the very beginning. Yeah. And when I tell them, what do you think about the famous idea of Ngugi that you should write in your African language, they will say, actually they did say, most of them said, well, English allows me to speak across ethnic identity or across tribe. English will allow me to be read in schools. And it's a wonderful principle to write in Kikuyu, but I will have a much smaller readership, even in Kenya, if I write that. What, how do you respond to this argument that comes from Kenyan writers and not from? No, first of all, first of all remember it is actually true uh, that if you write in English, you're more likely to get a publisher. So it's a, that's a practical thing. You're more likely to get a publisher sooner, right? You're more likely to find a journal that might publish your story, you know. Uh, you are more likely to get a reward more quickly. If you wrote in an African language, you might have to keep your story in your shelves for many, many years, okay? That's one. The other thing is, some of the younger writers, some of the younger generation, some of them were brought up, uh, particularly, not, I don't mean those who were born outside Kenya or outside Africa, like born in Europe or something. You know. those, even those born and bred in Africa, some of them were brought up by their parents to not know an African language. Sometimes, their parents would become more hostile to their children if they spoke an African language, which they, the parents, are actually speaking, right? So it's a big, so I'm not surprised that a young writer would say, look, um, do I have to wait for 20 years until I learn a Gekoyo? Huh? They have to do what they have to do. Okay, I don't I have no problem with that myself, yeah. Uh, this is what I'm talking about this as a whole changing. If today in Kenya or any African country there's actually a change in policy, the question of African writers writing in African languages would be solved immediately. Like that. If you are journals, if I know that if I wrote a short story in Nikoyo, I would find a journal published in, I'd be encouraged to write more. Okay? But now there isn't. I remember 10 years ago, I translated Molière through English you know, into Gekoyo. And even up to now, six years later, it's still not published. <laughs> right? Like yeah. Dante in Kikuyu. That yeah, maybe Dante. Maybe my, <laughs> right. Might. But you know, there's a whole structural problem. It's not simply individual deciding to write or not write. It's a whole, it's a problem. It's, a, it's like, I don't have, it's like we carry a big mountain in our heads or in our souls as, as a continent. And, and, yeah. and you pointed out that uh, at the end of the day, translation is really the key thing. And you've, uh, yeah. Corriere della Sera published a wonderful piece by you when you yeah. called translation a bridge, which is a wonderful Venetian yeah. metaphor, yeah. by yeah. the way. And so, um, yeah, 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 so trans yeah, 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 as you, as you, as you, as and, you that, and that's another thing. My, I mean, this story, the upright revolution, is now into 70 languages. You know, my own books, which are only the Koyo, they are, you know, translated. You know, I had done some myself, some other translators have done some others into English, and they are doing as well. I mean, there's no mystery about it. Um, Wizard of the Crow won the California gold medal. That's why I became a Californian. A, <laughs> the, the, most I, the moment I accepted the medal of, uh, for my novel, Wizard of the Crow, and it's given to Californians 
from Southern California. Then I to accept, although st I still carry my Kenyan passport, but I did accept that. Okay, then I'm as I'm Californian. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, while we yeah. wait for the Wizard of the Crow to be uh, translated, uh -huh. I just want to remind you that in a few minutes there will be a book signing uh, outside. And uh, apart from decolonizing the mind, it has been quoted uh, several times. Uh, you should certainly. Uh, get hold of a copy of Un Chicco di Grano, A Grain of Wheat is a fantastic novel where you find the memory of colonialism, the struggle for post colonialism you find the Bible, you find Marx, you find a lot of things. I would like Ijaba to ask the last question and... Uh, oh my God, only one. Okay, uh, I have to choose. Um, because I want to ask you something about the exile, yeah, because um, a lot of people in that moment live share with you this experience, a lot of refugees. In an interview for The Guardian, you wrote, exile is more than separation. And I remember the Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish, in a poem, uh, Mahmoud Darwish wrote, I quote from the poem, I'm from there, I'm from here. I'm not there and I'm not here. I have two names which meet and part, and I have two languages. I forget which of them I dream in. Here in this audience, all we know that you, Mr. Nguguwa Tiongo, have been in exile from your native land for over four decades. Today, after 40 years, what's the real meaning exile for you, and what's exile for refugee people now in Italy, in Europe, and in the United States? Yeah. Let me say that although now I live in California, I don't technically consider myself the exile, but I, because I know I can return. But there were for 23 years, from 1982 to 2003, I could not return to Kenya. And Abdallah has probably longer, probably. Huh? There are years he could not return to Kenya. You know, uh, so. Uh, but now at least we can return. Uh, although when I did actually go back to Kenya in the year 2003, I was 23 years of exile, and there was a change of government. My wife and I went back, and uh, we were 11 days to our uh, uh, 11 days after our arrival, we were attacked by armed gunmen uh, in our hotel, and. Uh, well, a terrible experience, you know, we had. So, uh, but now I can go back. Exile. In a way, I don't but for me, exile, that's why when it's forced exile, because I might make a distinction between forced exile and when you go to another country, well, Forced exile is when you are, when you cannot return to your home, right? Yeah. It's really almost like, like prison, you know. Um, because both have this commonality that you cannot interact with people at home, more or less. That's a, a basic idea in exile also. Uh, although slightly different, but it, there, in both situations, you are exiled from home, from the immediate environment. You are away, you know, uh, either inside a building called prison or somewhere else, you know, uh, like the years we live in London with the Ablativa, Abdallah, and every time we met, we always talked about home, right? <laughs> you know, uh, I could not, if I remember right, when I knew I could not return home, I would not even park properly, you know. I, I no, not. I kept my box parked, ready to return home anytime. Okay, ten years, five, one year, two years, five years, twenty years uh, <coughs> uh, passed. So exile is more, but but there's another way of looking at it. You look at the. Exile, the, okay, where exile actually is very, very important in our history of our civilization, okay? Uh, 
know. Remember all the religious leaders at one point and I were exiled, you know, huh? Even Jesus escaped to Egypt. Mohammed, I think, and his followers were rescued by Ethiopia at one point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exile. Look at all the uh, Karl Marx, <laughs> right? <laughs> Found refuge in uh, British Library, you know, in London and others, you know. Uh, all the Russian immigrants were the ones who left, you know, uh, you know sort of found a space. Even Brecht found some space in New York before he returned to uh, to Germany and so on, you know. Uh, so we sometimes might underestimate the importance, the impact of exile on our civilization, right? Uh, so exile is not always, does not always have negative <coughs> consequences. It can also, <coughs> like in my case, be, make me be more conscious of home. For reason I carry uh, believe it or not, despite all the problems I have uh, in going from one country to another, I, let me show you guys. You don't mind. This is my Kenyan passport. Uh, I always carry it. It's like, almost like a religious relic. <laughs> and even when I'm stopped, because when you've got a Kenyan passport or an African passport, you are stopped at every border. Like in every European country, they think you are coming to settle there. Uh, and I said, no, no, I don't, I have no interest, you know, in coming to settle. Like one day I was with my son, I was going to Germany and they stopped me. But my son, who is born in America, has an American passport, right? So he was ahead of me and he was allowed in, you know, then I was stopped, you know. So my son had to come back and try to rescue. And then the immigration officer was looking at me as if I had kidnapped an American boy. <laughs> so, so I said, please, I'm not coming. <laughs> so my son had to swear that I was really was his father. And we we're going for the launch of the German translation of my novel, you know, uh, Wizard of the Crow, and so on. So he goes, difficulties. It's much easier for me <clears throat> to get an American passport or double, then I can travel freely from many countries and so on, you know. But, but I cling to this really uh, very religiously. <laughs> and I think Ablatif <laughs> has done the same thing. Eh? For, I don't know, 50 years, he carries a Kenyan passport, <laughs> despite the difficulties. <laughs> Almost like the difficulties make, is an affirmation of my relation to my country, yeah. All right, we, we can say that we'll be always very welcome to Italy. And I ask for one last slide to be projected before we stop. Uh, Kafoskari's uh, appointment with Africa continues uh, later this month with a whole day called Afropean Bridges. So we uh, again draw on the image of the bridge. It will be a whole day where uh, we uh, analyze the relationship, the current relationships between uh, Europe and Africa, both the opportunities, the challenges, the uh, rampant Afrophobia. So I hope to see many of you there uh, at Kafoskari. Um, I look forward to see a long line outside for Professor Ngugi to sign his books. I thank Ijaba, and I think that the last word goes to our Vice Provost, Flavio Gregori. Who is the one who's been taken in by, his, by Professor Ngugi's gambles before. Um, volevo solo ricordare a tutti, come ha già fatto Shaul Bassi, che ci sarà il firma copie. Uh, bisogna approfittare della luce e del bel, bel tempo. Abbiamo avuto fortuna oggi. Eh, non senza però aver prima ringraziato il professor Ngugi, Shao Bassi e Jabba Shego di questa bellissima conversazione. <applausi>